Hi, I'm Samir Kapadia, Chairman of Cardiology at Cleveland Clinic, and I'm joined uh, with Dr. Amar Krishnaswamy. He's the head of our cath lab at Cleveland Clinic and a structural interventionist. We are both uh, excited to present you with the information on the tricuspid valve, new innovative treatments that we have been doing at Cleveland Clinic and in the world, because this is one of the most uh, currently very fast expanding field. So maybe Amar, you can highlight very briefly that what are the kind of challenges that we face with tricuspid valve disease, mainly tricuspid regurgitation, what are the most important challenges that we have? Is it in the diagnosing? First, let us look at the clinical presentation to say that in clinical presentation, what is the most important challenge that we face? So tricuspid regurgitation, of course, can present in a number of different types of disease states or patients with a lot of different uh, problems. And I think making sure that patients are on the optimal medical therapies and receive the optimal treatments for those diseases, whether it's left-sided valvular heart disease, uh, aortic or mitral valve disease, uh, congestive heart failure, pulmonary hypertension, atrial fibrillation. Uh, really, we need all of these things to come under optimal control to then understand is a tricuspid valve simply, uh, is a tricuspid regurgitation simply the result of those diseases that haven't been properly treated or on its own, does it also require a separate treatment? Now, very good. The question, one, one important thing that you raise is the optimal medical management. First of all, in the guidelines, there is really no optimal medical management other than diuretics. But I, I agree with you that one of the very important things is the treatment of the left side heart failure. So when, as you know, when we treat the left side heart failure, many times the tricuspid regurgitation goes away or gets much better uh, when we have optimal medical therapy. So it is not accurate to say that the guidelines don't have a proper medical management for this because they do for the left sided heart failure when it's coexistent. Second question is that, do you think that treating the atrial fibrillation and putting people in sinus rhythm, have you seen in your patient population the tricuspid regurgitation or mitral regurgitation get better? So uh, to kind of add on to the conversation we've been having, you know, I think all of us uh, in the section or in the department have taken care of a number of patients who once their aortic valve is treated, their mitral valve gets better or the tricuspid gets better. Once they're in a sinus rhythm, can, compared to atrial fibrillation, the tricuspid regurgitation gets better. Uh, once they're on optimal medical therapies, oftentimes the patients that are first referred to us for intervention on the mitral or the tricuspid valve, once they see our colleagues in the heart failure section and their medicines are changed, the regurgitation goes from severe to moderate. So I think it's impossible to discount uh, the effect right. of medical management or the management of the other uh, disease states. Do you think that people who have devices and their if they are newly placed devices particularly, uh, is it worth contacting the electrophysiologist and or the imaging people to understand if these devices are causing the problem? How do you really deal with those kind of patients? This is, a, I think, a very important group of patients, those who have either a defibrillator or a pacemaker, which consists uh, also of a ventricular lead. Uh, and a lot of this work is stuff that uh, review articles and other primary studies that uh, you have done uh, with the team to say that up to even 30 or 40 percent of people with a cardiac device can develop tricuspid regurgitation to a moderate or a severe degree. Importantly, when the electrophysiology group sees these patients, they often tell us that extracting the device is not necessarily going to change the tricuspid regurgitation for two reasons. One, when they extract the lead, if it's been in there for some time, it may damage the tricuspid valve, so you just trade one problem for another. Secondly, even if they extract the lead when they replace it, there's very little way to actually control exactly where it goes or if it doesn't impinge on a tricuspid valve leaflet. So importantly, I don't think that dealing with the lead itself at that point is a treatment strategy. But what we have learned over time is that with the help of our imaging colleagues and with a lot of the newer echocardiographic and 3D transesophageal echo imaging they have, they can give us an almost uh, gross appearance of the tricuspid valve and the lead going through to understand if we can still repair that valve even if the regurgitation is the result of a lead holding back the leaflet. Very good. And one just for the interest of something novelty. 
is that, of course, we have a lidless pacemaker. So some people, you can remove the lid and put a lidless pacemaker. And some people do believe that just like how you have dyssynchronous left ventricle, you can have a dyssynchronous right ventricle so that if you move the lead in a different position, the right ventricle may move synchronously with the septum and the tricuspid regurgitation may get better. So some people are suggesting that we may want to put more leads to make this right ventricle beat synchronously. So these are the new areas that people are investigating. With that in mind, the question comes up is that when you see a patient with tricuspid regurgitation that is severe or torrential, nowadays people call it torrential, what are the real treatment options for percutaneous therapy? Of course, there are treatment options for surgery, but surgery these days is not very common for isolated tricuspid regurgitation. So what are the real treatment options that exist? Although there is no approved treatment, what are the treatments that we are investigating in Cleveland Clinic that we can offer to people currently? So the 30,000 foot view I would give first uh, that's important to understand, especially uh, for physicians, is that until recently, there were no real studies that said that fixing the tricuspid valve is beneficial. And recently, in the last year, we've had large multicenter trials from Europe and smaller series that suggest actually that in comparison to medical therapies alone, tricuspid valve regurgitation treatment can help patients not only feel better, but also to live longer. And this has really brought the focus not only on should we treat the tricuspid valve, but when should we treat the tricuspid valve? Because once the regurgitation is torrential, as you said, once it starts to result in right-sided chamber enlargement and failure, Sometimes the percutaneous strategies we have are unable to fix the valve at that point. So getting on top of the regurgitation sooner, I think we're learning is more and more important than we ever knew. And so to then take it to one, other, one further step, what are the options we have? There are no commercially available options uh, at this point in time, but what we have learned in using some devices, uh, most commonly the mitra clip in an off-label fashion, um, and there are article uh, trials uh, that have been done in Europe on this. We're gaining more experience in America. And uh, you and I, of course, have been doing this more and more frequently here at Cleveland Clinic, is when we treat the mitral valve, we also clip the tricuspid valve. And our patients really, I think, have benefited greatly in this regard because it treats not only the left heart failure, but also the right heart failure. And so as a result of many of these single center experiences, there's actually a trial now uh, in which we enroll uh, called Triluminate, which takes patients to treat uh, using the mitra clip uh, on the tricuspid valve. There's another uh, early feasibility study in which, again, we are a part uh, using the Edwards-Pascal system, also similarly to bring together the tricuspid valve leaflets. And then the last arena of therapy in this regard, percutaneous strategies, is uh, transcatheter tricuspid valve replacement. Uh, and I'm going to defer to you because you were involved in the major early work in this regard. Right. We did our first, it is uh, good to know that we did our first human implantation, which was now about four years ago, uh, where we replaced the tricuspid valve first time ever in a human being in the world. And this valve was developed at Cleveland Clinic with Dr. Navia. And we did the first in man study for the first time FDA also allowed us to do the first in-man study in the United States and we replaced the valve successfully. Subsequently, 30 such valves were implanted, but still commercially is not available. The other, there are several companies now which has developed a tricuspid valve replacement therapy. Uh, all of these are still investigational and many of them are just in the early feasibility stage. So we don't have a pivotal trial to compare. So mostly we are using tricuspid valve repair technologies and the ring, so when the valve dilates, when the annulus dilates, you can bring the annulus back together with percutaneous rings also. So there are two other rings that are in early feasibility or in the uh, early trials that are available that can also be used for treating the tricuspid valve. The, is it the main purpose improving the symptoms? and the quality of life or 
it does, you know, what are the endpoints that most of these trials looking for? What are they looking for to do when you say, see these patients? So in the trials, uh, it's oftentimes very difficult to quantify what are the uh, parameters that improve because even in the repair trials where we see that patients feel better, the echocardiographic reduction in tricuspid regurgitation may not seem as obvious. And so there's a lot of interest in what should be the actual outcome measures in these trials. And in that regard, there's been a lot more granular, uh, uh, I should say there's been a lot more focus on how granular we should uh, quantify the tricuspid regurgitation, so making different, uh, different algorithms in what's mild, moderate, severe, torrential, or even greater than that. We're also focusing a lot more on some of the functional outcomes in these studies because it has been relatively unclear what the association of tricuspid regurgitation and survival is, but what is more clear is how people feel. And so understanding outcomes like walking distance, heart failure admissions, things of that nature are very important endpoints for these tricuspid trials. And some, peop some people who have ascites, so in getting rid of ascites, recurrent peri uh, perisyn perisyntesis, or even edema scale, some people have used, some people have said that how much diuretics you need and how much strength you have, obviously, because the cardiac output increases. The, what, what would be the message for the cardiologists who are looking after patients with tricuspid regurgitation? What should they do? Should they send all the patients for percutaneous treatment? Should they manage them medically first and then send them? Should they wait for heart to dilate and people will getting very symptomatic? Or should they treat, send early before all these things happen for at least consideration of some treatment? What should be the message? I think that the theme of, of cardiology and interventional cardiology over the last decade, in truth, has been that we all do better as physicians and for our patients when we have a bigger team. And so I think for cardiologists who are not at a center that offers percutaneous tricuspid therapies, I think we are always happy to see more patients because it's much better to see a patient early rather than to see them when the heart is dilated, when we don't have an option to treat. So I think it makes a good, it's good teamwork and it makes a good collaborative effort for the patient. If, even if we see them early, then we can say, hey, follow with your routine cardiologist and let's keep in touch over time if the patient is asymptomatic or the tricuspid regurgitation isn't substantial. For the patients who are getting into symptoms or more significant tricuspid regurgitation, the key message from a lot of the percutaneous trials is that we know we're going to do better for them when we see them sooner. Because eventually when the heart dilates, when the tricuspid valve leaflets get too far apart, we can't even fix them. And at that point, unfortunately, we don't have an option for the patient. So one of the most common reasons where pe people come to us and we are going to say no, that we cannot do anything, is because they are presenting to us very late. Mm -hmm. Is that the sense that you also have from your clinical practice? Absolutely. And so I think the general consensus is that, that we should, have, we should see these patients little bit early and treat the tricuspid valve earlier because the symptoms, by the time they develop symptoms, the heart is already dilated, the right heart is failing, and the right heart being a low pressure chamber, when it fails, that means it's really damaged, and this is not the time when you can easily repair the tricuspid valve and hope for a miracle. So I think you have to, we have to design the trials accordingly, and we have to treat the patients earlier than we have ever been treating for other valve diseases. So that should be the message. And I think this is an exciting time, uh, good options for the patient. So uh, we are very excited to present these all options uh, for your patients.